Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am greatly honored to be here at this conference examining Jewish life and anti-Semitism in contemporary Europe and to say a few words about Canada's foreign policy priority of promoting and protecting freedom of religion and our collective efforts to advance this core human right. However, I do want, like many others have already, draw particular attention to the exemplary efforts, the exemplary efforts of the Tom Lantosh Institute to draw attention to the alarming resurgence of anti-Semitism and to mobilize efforts to combat this situation through building partnerships and organizing events such as this. I think we all benefited this morning from a, a number of very excellent speeches and interventions. And I just want to say I think it's very easy to see why Mrs. Annette Lantosh is such a role model uh, to her family. And I also want to thank in particular uh, Dr. Katrina Lantos uh, Sweat for her leadership on freedom of religion, both in her capacity with the Lantos Institute, the Lantos Foundation, but also with the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. She is not only a great uh, counterpart and interlocutor for myself and for the Government of Canada, but also uh, has become uh, a great friend. I want to congratulate the Lantos Institute on your successes, and I pledge my commitment and that of the Office of Religious Freedom within the Government of Canada to support ongoing efforts to combat anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism, in addition to being abhorrent to our human nature, is certainly a particularly gross violation of religious freedom. Freedom of religion is a right that is unfortunately under increasing threat around the world today. A number of speakers prior to myself have highlighted some of these issues. The Washington-based Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life indicates that one-third of the countries in the world today have high or very high restrictions on freedom of religion. As some of the restrictive countries are very populous, roughly 75% Three quarters of the world's population live in countries with high restrictions. This is up from 70% in 2011. This conference, as I know you are no, uh, you're all no doubt aware, is particularly important as there remain serious challenges to promoting and protecting freedom of religion and in particular, combating anti-Semitism throughout the world, not simply its resurgent forms here in Europe. During my outreach since being named Canada's first ambassador for religious freedom in February of this year, I've traveled extensively and engaged officials and community and religious leaders on this issue in an effort to build partnerships and to draw attention to violations of freedom of religion. In fact, just a few days ago, I presented uh, remarks at the 2013 OSCE Human Dimension Implementation Meeting in Warsaw, where I discussed the increasing threats against many religious communities around the world. I also took the time to visit the Auschwitz-Birkenau site and reflect on the unparalleled sacrifice of the Jewish people during the Holocaust. And if I may just offer a personal reflection as uh, a younger person, at least for a few more years. Standing for that first time at Auschwitz, I found the air to be very heavy. And as a Canadian born two generations after the Shoah, a Canadian of Scottish and Irish ancestry, I experienced a numbness standing there and a profound emptiness as I stood next to the crematoria of Auschwitz. I did not know how to weep enough standing there. Clearly the Holocaust has left an indelible mark on our common history and Canada's leadership and the international community's continuing commitment is needed to ensure that we will never allow such horrors to occur again. As the government of Canada, we are deeply concerned about the ongoing targeting of religious communities characterized not only in increasing social hostilities towards religious communities in different parts of the world, 
but also in increasing government restrictions against those who wish to freely exercise their religious beliefs, both individually and collectively as members of religious communities. Jews, Tibetan Buddhists, Chaldean Christians in Iraq, Coptic Orthodox Christians in Egypt, Shia Muslims in many parts of the Muslim world, and many other people of faith experience difficulty in their ability to worship and practice their faith in peace and security. Now, I've heard it said by some that it's difficult to promote freedom of religion when so many different views exist. How then can we find common ground? I would respond in this manner. We need to look to existing universally accepted human rights instruments for a way forward and to establish a common understanding. These instruments reflect the importance of human dignity, a dignity that was violated repeatedly during the Holocaust. Article 18 of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights states the following, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his or her religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community with others and in private or public to manifest his or her religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. Despite our collective efforts, the threat to religious communities continue to increase. Unfortunately, the reality on the ground in many parts of the world has moved in the opposite direction as compared to our commitments to protect and promote freedom of religion. We must not be indifferent to religious communities and individuals within those communities being persecuted and often killed. We also need to emphasize that religious freedom does not simply mean the freedom to worship, as is reflected in Article 18, which gives a more expansive understanding of this freedom. Indeed, it establishes a broad understanding of this fundamental human right. Put simply, the international understanding of freedom of religion is multifaceted, incorporating the freedom to study one's faith, the freedom to preach it, the freedom to engage in missionary activity, the freedom to change one's faith, and the freedom to hold no religious beliefs. However, deeds need to go much farther than words. Words are fine. Fora such as this are very important. As one speaker before said, these are milestones along the way in combating anti-Semitism and in combating those who would violate religious freedom. We need to ensure that international instruments risk, uh, are more than simply words on paper. We need to work together to protect the basic dignity of all, including this very basic right of religious freedom. Canada continues to be concerned by legislation in some states pertaining to registration of religious organizations, which can be used to obstruct and to curtail activities of religious communities. We are concerned by blasphemy laws that consider criticism of religious beliefs, religious organizations, and religious practices or religious debate to be a crime. We are concerned by the ongoing threats against those who may wish to change the religion. We are concerned by the inability of some religious communities to peacefully practice their religion without the threat of violence and persecution. And finally, we are concerned over the resurgence of anti-Semitism in parts of Europe and the new virulent forms, virulent forms of anti-Semitism in parts of the Middle East masquerading as criticism of the State of Israel. We should note that even countries that have constitutional protections for religious freedom and claim to subscribe to international standards can be some of the most problematic in terms of persecutions. The challenge here is to separate the rhetoric from the reality and to look at actual implementation of human rights obligations. Religious freedom is not a theological issue. It helps to have some theological understanding but it is not, at its heart, a theological issue. It is a human issue, which has, at its heart, the inherent dignity which we all possess as human beings, 
regardless of faith. It speaks to our inherent desire to understand who we are as human beings, who we are in relationship to others, who we are in relationship to the world in which we live, and in our relationship to God or to a particular philosophy we may wish to embrace. All of us as human beings possess free will. We must have the freedom to exercise this free will in matters of faith. Human dignity is and must be central to the message of freedom of religion. Canada, as many of you will know, is a pluralist society of many cultures and many faiths, living in peace and security with one another. We all share a common humanity. We all have a common duty to defend the rights of the afflicted and to give voice to the voiceless. It is for this reason that the Canadian government has created the Office of Religious Freedom. We are focused on protecting and advocating on behalf of religious communities under threat. We are focused on opposing religious hatred, engaging in open and frank discussion, and promoting the ability of religious communities to manifest their faith and to contribute to society openly and in a free and secure environment. Indeed, the goals of the Office of Religious Freedom reflect these universal principles of democracy, freedom, human rights, and the rule of law. These are core Canadian values. They are not culturally specific, however. They are not the sole preserve of Western liberal democracies. We believe that these are universal principles that speak to human dignity, that speak to an objective universal truth. It is the duty of all countries to defend and uphold freedom of religion as a fundamental freedom of all human beings. This principle, I believe, is perhaps best expressed by the 17th century English political philosopher John Locke, who wrote in his 1689 letter concerning toleration. He wrote that nobody, therefore, neither single persons nor churches, nay, nor even commonwealths, have any just title to invade the civil rights and worldly goods of each other upon pretense of religion. Those that are of another opinion would do well to consider with themselves how pernicious a seed of discord and war, how powerful a provocation to endless hatreds and slaughters they thereby furnish unto mankind. Canada, through the Office of Religious Freedom, identifies countries of engagement where government restrictions on freedom of religion or belief exist, where social hostilities exist that lead to active persecution and violence against religious communities, or where both conditions exist in the same state. There are many issues of great concern to our office. The harsh punishment, persecution, and targeting of individuals for apostasy, blasphemy, heresy, and related religious offenses are just a few. Again, as many before me have stated, and I think it bears stating again, we must not be indifferent in the face of this, in the face of these persecutions, in the face of those who would seek to rob people, deny people of their fundamental right to freedom of religion. Canada and Canadians are not indifferent. It must be recognized that to speak out against repressive policies in many countries is to risk imprisonment, torture, and death. Often freedom of religion is not violated by an overt act of government, but often through a government's inability or unwillingness to protect a particular religious community from violence perpetrated against it by members of another community. Canada is prepared to lead with our partners and to promote the, dig the dignity of the human being and each human being's inherent right to profess and practice their faith freely. Societies that protect religious freedom are absolutely most likely to protect other fundamental freedoms, whether that be democratic freedoms, freedom of expression, freedom of association, equality between men and women. To this end, Canada's Office of Religious Freedom will continue to oppose religious hatred without favor to a particular religious community. 
we will seek to reflect the very best, not only of Canadian society, but of humanity. We will seek to advance these universal principles that speak to that truth, freedom, democracy, the rule of law, and human rights. Thank you again to uh, the Lantos Foundation and Institute. Thank you to all of you for your attention and for your willingness to work together with Canada and all people of goodwill, whether it be here in Hungary, whether it be in Europe, or any other part of the world, to combat anti-Semitism and to advance freedom of religion for all of our fellow human beings. Thank you very much for your attention.